Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of Macbeth Act 5, Scene 2. Here we have a number of Scottish lords who comment on what's about to happen with the English forces alongside Malcolm and Macduff who are approaching Macbeth's castle. Notice that we have an epithet ascribed to Macduff that's in enormous contrast to those ascribed to Macbeth. Here it's good Macduff, something that uh, demonstrates the high regard in which he's held by the Scottish lords. Also, we have a reference, a hyperbolic reference, to the kind of feelings exhibited by Macduff, Malcolm, etc. Revenges burn in them. And that metaphorical use of the verb burn really gives a sense of the passion and the depth of feeling exhibited by Macduff and Malcolm, given the murders of their respective families. And this is made even more clear through the fact that their dear causes would, to the bleeding and the grim alarm, excite the mortified man. In other words, they have causes that affect them dearly. Uh, Shakespeare's using this uh, hyperbolic metaphor of um, a mortified man, a dead man, being excited um, to get into the bloodshed and the noise of war because of the kind of causes that are driving them. In this case, the murder of the father for Malcolm and uh, the family for Macduff. In reference to Macbeth, Caithness says, Some say he's mad. Others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. And one of the interesting things about this is that uh, Shakespeare's conveying the lack of love for Macbeth in Scotland through the use of a comparative, not through antithesis. It's not that some say he's mad, others say that he's uh, perfectly sane, but it's either he's mad or if they hate him less, they call it valiant fury. So it's just people either hate him or hate him a little bit. There's no love for Macbeth. So that use of lesser is really important as a comparative adjective. Macbeth's bravery, which was seen as so positive in Act 1, Scene 2, has now been transformed into something negative. Uh, those that hate him slightly less describe his behaviour as valiant fury. And so it's a bravery that's associated with outrage and anger, um, certainly not something positive. However, Caveness says that um, while there may be some doubt over the level of hatred for Macbeth, what is certain is that he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. So we have a metaphor here of Macbeth being unable to constrain his bloated rule, rather like someone trying to put a belt around their waist when they're so fat that they're unable to actually buckle it. Um, this is what Macbeth's rule's like. It's so chaotic, it's so overblown, it's so full of um, ill behaviours that it's impossible to create a sense of order. Angus's comments are structured through the use of anaphora. So we have, now does he feel, now minutely revolts, now does he feel his title. So the anaphora that begins each of those clauses with now gives a sense of how overwhelmed Macbeth is at this particular point in time. It's as if the ingredients of the poison challenge are returning to plague the inventor, that everything is coming back to haunt him. The reference to his secret murder sticking on his hands is an allusion to Act 2, Scene 2 again. Now the blood on Macbeth's hands is universalised. It can't be washed away and everyone can now see his guilt. The reference to his secret murder sticking on his hands is an allusion to Act 2, Scene 2 again. Now the blood on Macbeth's hands is universalised. It can't be washed away and everyone can now see his guilt. And then we have an extended simile to show how unsuited Macbeth is to his role as king. Um, it echoes the metaphor used earlier about uh, being unable to uh, buckle his belt. Here he feels his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarvish thief. So he has this mantle, this giant's robe, something that's enormous responsibility, the role of king, resting upon the shoulders of a dwarvish thief. He's a little man, absolutely unscrupulous and immoral man who is taking on this role that just doesn't fit him. It's not suited to him. Shakespeare goes on to employ two extended metaphors, the first a medical one and the second a horticultural one. In terms of the medical, we have this idea of the sickly wheel uh, being purged. So it's the idea really of um, soldiers returning to this sickly country of Scotland and purging it by spilling their blood. 
Um, and then secondly, the horticultural uh, metaphor uses this idea of that blood watering the true monarchy to dew the sovereign flower and drowning the weeds of Macbeth's rule. And finally, Lennox concludes with, make we our march towards Burnham, uh, the scene ending on an ominous note foreshadowing Macbeth's final downfall given the prophecy of the third apparition. It's almost as if Shakespeare ends the scene with a duh, duh, duh. Okay, ta.